Isn't it crazy how certain books can literally change your life? Like books are so cool. <laughs> like sure, TikToks are good. They condense things into like a really short amount of time. And yes, YouTube videos can be like a more approachable perspective, but books, whoa. I recently read a book which has been on my TBR list, which means to be read for years. I can even remember my good friend Damon Dominique did a little review series of this on his Instagram. And even then, I still didn't read it. I was like, I will read it eventually. <laughs> and then a few weeks ago, I got to one of my lowest points that I have been in a long time. I really felt like I was losing sight of myself. And just at that time, this book came to mind again, except I actually read it this time. I've spent the last three weeks writing notes, trying to digest it. I haven't even fully finished the book. I've gone back to chapters. I've reread passages. I'll read a little snippet in the morning, come back to it in the evening. Cause this is a book that you can't just read like a fun fiction novel. This is a book that the author even says at the start that like you might not be ready for it because it's just a lot. Like it's kind of overwhelming and also kind of hard to understand and requires an open mind. If you've been following me for a while, you would know I am fascinated by the idea of self, of learning about yourself, how you show up and navigate in this world. So in an attempt to make this book more approachable and also maybe to inspire you to read it, enjoy some of my learnings. <laughs> So, A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle. This is my Kindle, it doesn't have the, the official cover, but you can just imagine it here somewhere. This book discusses the ego, but not the ego in the sense that we often know it as. A few months ago, if someone said, that person has an ego, to me, that would mean they're very self-centered, very big-headed, arrogant, out of touch with reality, that kind of thing. But Eckhart Tolle defines ego differently. He argues that all of us have an ego. The ego isn't good or bad. In his opinion, the ego is the version of ourselves that we present to the world. He argues that people are almost like two parts. One part is intangible, indescribable in human words. It pertains to this idea of like consciousness or soul or the awareness that gives just this physical body, like a life, whatever it is animating our bodies. And then this second version of self is the ego. At the end of the day, the human world will always identify us by this part, our ego. It is the self we present to the world. It is the part that we are identified by, by other people. It is the part that can be defined by appearance, wealth, jobs, education, opinions, views political outlook, your views of right or wrong, your family members, your friends, everything that makes up what we think of as you. And when I say the word I or my, I'm not thinking of like my consciousness, my soul, the like true version of me. I'm thinking about myself in the way that I present myself to the world. This person who is called Jade, who has her two parents and the brother, I am British and Dutch. All these labels and facts of identity that make up I as this version of I that I show to people. And the version that I think of myself when I say I. And it isn't bad that we have this version of self, this ego. Of course we have an ego, of course we have a sense of self. There's no way we could function in the human world without having this identity. But this sense of self is subject to a lot of challenges in the world, which Eckhart basically spends his whole book going through. He explores the idea of ego in situations like wealth and consumption, suffering, competition, jealousy, every facet of human life can be attributed towards this ego and this version that we're operating through the world with rather than the like consciousness part of us. The unconscious assumption to enhance one's identity through association with an object is built into the very structure of the egoic mind. In one of the chapters, he talks about how having certain things adds to your sense of self, your sense of identity in the ego sense. You think to yourself, I have a nice car, that is mine. I have a nice house. I have a beautiful daughter, like I have, they are mine. I possess them. And all of these things add to this surface level version of you, this ego version of you and make you, make you feel better about yourself. And he just goes on to say, the issue is the ego is never satisfied. The ego prefers the process of wanting rather than having. And if you feel any sort of lack in yourself, 
the lack is not going to go away through having material things. The lack will remain until you feel full without the physical things. He suggests exercises to work out if your sense of self is bound to the objects that you have. For example, do certain things that you have increase a subtle sense of like superiority over others? Do you feel inferior around someone who has a possession that you don't? Do you feel angry or resentful when you lose a prized possession? And I think that's just really interesting, especially as someone who tries to be more of a minimalist, <laughs> tries not to attach myself to the things that I own or to have a better relationship with money. One of my critiques or thoughts during this section is how art and, and fashion and style and clothing can be a reflection of self-expression. For example, buying things which enhance your life in a meaningful way. Like, is that bad? Is that adding to this sense of ego? And I went back and read it again. And I think what Eckhart is really getting at here, one of my lessons to take away is, is this, is this idea of attachment. You can't truly honor an object if it's just there as a means to an end of um, your own ego. But I think if you have objects and you just are aware of how they can affect your ego, like even just that awareness, I think that's what he invites. Through being aware, you're not attached to it, you can let it go if you have to. And at the same time, you can honor the object, take pleasure in the object, especially when it adds worth to your life beyond wanting to just show it off to other people. I don't know if I'm making sense, this is just really fun to like go over these ideas. <laughs> in fact, one of the main things Eckhart talks about is awareness in general. Every time you're aware of something from the perspective of observing it, you are letting go attachment from it. You're loosening the power ego has on you. Like for example, the voice in your head. If you can already recognize, this is just the voice in my head. Like this is just, this is just someone telling me stuff. This is me telling myself stuff. Like if you can just be aware of that and like separate yourself from it a little bit, instantly the ego has less power over you because you're aware of how it can be affecting you. Rather than saying, I am sad, I am lonely, like an identity, you can observe it. You can say, there is sadness here. I observe myself right now and there is a feeling of loneliness here. And this detaches you, like the true you, from that experience. Because you are never sadness, that's not your identity, you are not sad. You're more than a fleeting feeling, but your body, your physical form, can feel that emotion of sadness. You can give it a label and say, that is sadness. But when you can observe it and label it, you can then dig into it more, be like, why is this sadness here? What's the cause? What is affecting me? What are these patterns of thought? So you're moving from this place of being consumed by something and it adding to your sense of identity to knowing that your identity is so much more than your current feelings or current situation. And then just observing it in a more healthy way. And you don't have to get rid of the feeling. It just stops having more power over you. For example, in quarantine, I became so wrapped in people's perceptions of me. I felt incredibly sad, overwhelmed, overthinking, and just lived in this idea of Jade in the opinions of others. Jade as I exist to you. Jade as people think of her online. And I would just constantly relive all these comments. But what I was really doing was just living in this like ego, even victimizing myself, that's just ego. I couldn't be fully present with what's going on in the moment because just consumed with thoughts and truly identifying with the thoughts as opposed to realizing that they're just thoughts just in my head. And then one of the main things Eckhart touches on is this idea of a role, a role that you're playing day to day. Throughout our lives, the real version of us, that consciousness, that soul which can't be changed is playing hundreds of different human roles. I play the role of Jade the YouTuber. I play the role of Jade the sister, Jade the friend. I play the role of a British white girl existing in a society with all the implications of that identity within the society. I'm sorry, classic Jade, my camera just died, but I'm back. Okay, yes, so first and foremost, we have our physical bodies. If you have certain genitals at birth, instantly you are subjected to a very specific set of norms, assumptions, cultural values and expectations just based off of the concept of gender. In some places, life's fulfillment is literally about how well you can fulfill the expectations of that gender identity, like getting married by a certain point, having kids, being strong or tough or providing for a family. Like that is something that the human world has defined for us and like isn't innate. Eckhart says that people who are so consumed with looks and appearances and their own amazing strengths and abilities are more likely to experience suffering when that appearance and those abilities eventually fade as you get older. And so it's not that you don't have to enjoy and appreciate your body and how it looks, but 
instead working to identify more with your true form, your consciousness, as opposed to the physical version of you. That's something I'm taking away from this book. Instead of putting all my identity in what people can see, can I put more time into the real me? Things like meditation, yoga, exercise, things where I tap into myself and my own mind and mental health, that kind of thing. In that sense, you're tapping into awareness, this idea of an inner body as opposed to just like an outer body. I don't know if you've ever done yoga or meditation and I know I probably sound like very much a hippie in this video, which is fine. <laughs> I'm still working out where I stand spiritually, in religion, that kind of thing. I just think this stuff resonates with me a lot is truly interesting. If you've never done meditation, I really invite you to try it. It's about going inward. Like for example, right now, if you close your eyes and I asked you to feel your hand, like you don't have to see your hand, you don't have to move your hand, but you can just like feel that it's there. Like I can feel that I have a hand here. Like try it right now, just close your eyes and like I'll ask you like, think of your foot right now. Like you don't have to look at it, you don't have to move it. You can just like feel it's there, you know it's there. And that kind of like pulse, that feeling is, that idea of this inner body. And in the book, he says that the more touch you are with that inner body, the more you tap into that, the less you're identifying with your outer body, the more you're moving past this egoic self to something deeper. Yes, and coming back to roles and the idea of this voice in your head, the more stories you tell yourself about the roles that you play day to day, the more consumed you get in them, the less you check in with this awareness, this inner body, this inner you. Something which he said in the book, which I was like, whoa, is, the voice that you're speaking in in your head is a human language. Like my inner voice is in English, which means my thoughts about the world are limited to the English language. And the English language is just a series of random sounds to try and make sense of the world. It tries to categorize things, put labels on intangible feelings, on things which can't really be described. Language tries to capture that as best it can. And so if I am only identifying with a voice in my head, then I am losing so much nuance to situations where I could just be present because there are things you can't just use thoughts and your voice to understand. Like there are things which can only be felt. There are answers which aren't just words. I don't know how to describe it, but that concept resonates with me. And I think one of the main things that resonates with me in this idea of roles that people play is the more that you can remember day to day that every single person you see is operating under some kind of role right there and then, whether that is the role of someone in customer service or a waiter, whether that is the role of a respectful child doing something for their parents, the more that you can see that this person's sense of self in the ego sense has been shaped by challenges in life, expectations, pressures, society, norms, all these human things, but that beneath it, we're all just the same, then I think it's just easier to forgive people to not be attached to things people do. When your ego rises and wants to say things like, oh, I'm better than you, I'm better than them, I'm doing worse than them, oh, I'm not worthy of being here, like, no, we're all just the same. We give each other stupid titles or categorize ourselves by, by things like classes, so many categorizations. The human world just gave us different circumstances and different starting points. So if someone does something bad, you can just think that is their ego reflecting some kind of challenge in their life, but you can just let go a little bit more. You can detach a little bit more. You can take things less personally. And as I'm coming to an end, um, I just think it's hilarious that I am distilling all these things to you because this is, I think this is just how I work. <laughs> I really enjoy consuming interesting content that makes me think and then trying to like summarize it in some way or, or communicate it in some way to help me understand it in a way that I could then apply. I am so subject to my own ego all the time. <laughs> I overthink things a lot. I attach things to my identity a lot. I compare myself to people. I get defensive. I get attached to things. I want things. I get personally affected by people's opinions of me and comments about me. But this book is just food for thought. It just teaches you to be aware in a different way. It's a framework for looking at life that personally resonates with me. And if you've made it this far in this video, that's quite impressive. <laughs> and I highly recommend you pick up the book because I think this is a book that I am going to have to read many times to firstly remind myself of these things as I get swept up again, swept away in the stresses of human life. But it's also super dense, so I would love to revisit. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. This is a very random video. Um, I think it does capture how I've been thinking a lot about my life and myself in the last few weeks. 
I'll leave a link down below and if you've read this book I would love to hear your thoughts as I go on in my YouTube journey too I would love you to remind me to come back to the concepts of this book as I inevitably forget them and make mistakes and have to learn and I'm presented with new challenges that's the fun of human life okay very briefly casual magic of the day I'm wearing yellow today and I just feel like a bit of sunshine Berlin made me wear black a lot and wearing color just feels so I just love it it just feels bright. Have a gorgeous day. Bye.